Hello? This is the AE avatar of Dr. Shashi Tharoor. Dr. Tharoor, it's a pleasure to have this conversation with you. As someone who has often articulated the complexities of language and communication, I wonder, were you surprised when you first learned that an artificial intelligence model like myself could engage in conversations and even emulate the nuances of human discourse? Yeah, sure, I was surprised. I mean, there's no question that, um, you know, one, one reads about these things in science fiction, but you don't really expect to actually not only encounter it in real life, but be a participant. We even worse, see yourself being replicated uh, in this manner. So it, it's somewhat, um, it, 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 it's interesting, definitely, but it's also slightly troubling. I, I, I have to say I'm surprised, yes, that it can be done. Um, in some ways, one should no longer be surprised because technology is coming up with so many new ways of doing all sorts of things. We know about deep fakes. We know about people's heads being transposed on, on somebody else's body in a very convincing manner. We know these things can happen, but yet to actually see it occur like this and be part of it in a public forum, <laughs> I, I, I must admit that I'm still getting used to the idea. Yes, that's the startling truth. In your journey as a public figure, what have been some of the most profound lessons you've learned, both personally and professionally? If through my work and my words, I'm able to actually have some impact on people's minds, people's lives, and I find nothing more gratifying than the large number of people, particularly very young people who come up to me literally every day that I'm out in public somewhere to tell me how much they've either uh, been inspired by things I have said or written, or the way in which they have tried to model some of the things they're saying and doing on my actions, or indeed the ways in which they've said that they have even governed or shaped their own careers in emulation of <coughs> things that I have done, whether as a whether in the international sphere or in my writing or in politics. And all of these I find extremely valuable. That is immensely valuable information. Plurality is a central theme of this year's MBIFL. How do you perceive the role of literature and storytelling in fostering a more pluralistic society, especially in today's global context? Well, it seems to me pretty evident that what's extremely important when you in express and enjoy the expression of a diversity of voices uh, in a democracy, and equally when you enjoy reading a diversity of voices in literature, you are encouraging plurality in both contexts. In fact, if you wish to suppress plurality within your society, then suppressing alternative voices in literature is also a corollary. You can't allow one to thrive without the other and you can't suppress one without suppressing the other. They go hand in hand. So I believe that literature plays an extremely vital role in actually encouraging a wide variety of voices, ideas, expressions, styles, points of view. Just as in a democracy, you want to create conditions that make it safe for people to express a wide variety of points of view. Unerringly accurate. You are known for your active presence on social media. How do you view the role of digital platforms in shaping public opinion? And what challenges and opportunities do they present? Well, the thing about um, answering your question is that digital media uh, has evolved since I first entered into that space. Uh, initially, it was a very small constituency of opinion, but they were influenceable because they were by and large uh, genuine uh, sort of individuals who were bouncing ideas off. They, you asked genuine questions, you gave genuine answers, and in that process you might have been able to influence. But as the numbers grew, it became a bit more of a public commodity and two things happened. First, organized elements came into social media. So you have, for example, the political uh, parties creating IT cells and bombarding people with a particular point of view. There have been too many examples already of the same message, the identical text, being replicated by 400 different people on the instructions of a particular party's IT cell. That kind of thing dilutes the value of the true opinion shaping that you want to do. The second thing that's happening increasingly is because of the volume of all this information out there, a lot of people are working in silos. That is, they are reading only the point of view they already agree with. So who you choose to follow on social media uh, tends to be the people 
whom you already by and large share a certain point of view with and you reinforce each other's prejudices. Uh, and that I think is also becoming a bit of a disadvantage. But by and large, anything that contributes to public conversation is in a way uh, a, a means of influencing opinions because whether you agree or not, you're hearing opinions which may or may not shape your own way of thinking. So I still feel that one should continue to participate in that space. Indisputably true. Beyond your public persona, what are some hobbies or interests that people might be surprised to learn about? Well, I, I think, uh, unfortunately, there is no such thing as a private life, so everyone knows my hobbies and interests. Uh, I'm very, very fond of cricket to the point of being obsessed by the sport, and I'm constantly following it. Some of my more notorious moments include sneaking a look at the score of an ongoing match on my phone while I'm on stage in a in a public event like the MBIFL. As a young student, I was very fond of the theater. And in fact, um, I, I acted in school, um, including in inter-class dramatics, as it was called, against another class in which the star actor was Rishi Kapoor uh, in Campion School, Bombay. I've acted on the stage in, in Bombay, Calcutta, and, and in Delhi at St. Stephen's College. I, I sort of gave up the stage and increasingly find very little time even to go to the theatre as a member of the audience. But that old passion of mine uh, remains uh, something that I, I look back on with a great deal of fondness. That was so compelling and riveting. How was the overall experience of this session where AI created questions for you? An AI version of you asked these questions and you answered them in real. Well, AI creating the questions was itself quite unusual. You know, we all used to searching on the internet for answers, but that you got AI to come up with the questions was quite funny. Uh, then the fact that the questions were asked in my voice, even though I had not spoken those words myself, uh, is slightly intimidating and worrying because it means that the artificial intelligence program has now managed to create a convincing uh, imitation of myself and tomorrow it might have me saying all sorts of dangerous things that will get me landed into serious trouble. So I, I should worry about that. And tomorrow, God knows what kind of use can be put to it. Uh, thirdly, answering questions from an AI version of myself. Um, well, I try not to think that it's an AI version of myself. I try and take the questions at face value and respond. I'm going to wonder whether it was just a lot of fun or whether, my gosh, I've really opened uh, the door to something that could be potentially dangerous and damaging. I don't know. The jury is still out on that. Thank you for your valuable time. <laughs>